Hello, everyone. Today I am actually, I think for the first time, I have like a stage fright. I know you're not on the stage, but I feel anxious because my guest today is someone, it's like a dream come true for me today. Um, you will see my guest very soon. I'm very, very happy that I will be able to talk to him. And I'm sure you will enjoy this topic as, as I, I love this topic so much. But I would like to ask you if you could follow me on Instagram. It's um, actually attached below. It's Anya K underscore 44. And all the links um, attached will be to my guest and his books and his work and his website. So everything will be below. Thank you so much for watching and I will be waiting for my very special guest today. Let me start. So hello everyone who's watching, my lovely subscribers, beautiful people there. Today I'm for the first time, like I said, to Robert Schwartz, who is my guest, and I will um, introduce Robert to you now. I am for the first time like anxious <laughs> because I was like, am I prepare myself enough for this conversation? It's a very special moment for me. Um, and I tell you why after I introduce Robert. Robert Schwartz is an author of the book and I read many books but there is no other book like your soul's plan. This was the book that literally changed my life and touched me so deeply like no other book has ever did. And I am an author myself and I read many books, but you, you have to get this book. I will attach all the links below, but let me talk about Robert for a moment. Robert is a healer, right? Robert, you're a healer. You, you do sessions as well. He's an incredible author. And then again, like from someone who's writing, like I'm a writer, when I was reading Robert's book, actually two books, Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift, his style of writing, it's so incredibly natural and easy to absorb and understand that you feel you know, like when you watch a good movie, you feel like you're almost in the movie. That's how you feel when you read Robert's book. Like you are connected with the book so much, like it's a part of you. This book is incredible because it speaks about discovering the real meaning of the life that you have planned before you were born. And another book, The Soul's Gift, which to me personally, I actually look at those two books now as almost as one for me, like they're complete as a one piece. The second book is The Healing Power of Life You Have Planned Before You Were Born. And that one actually focuses on the challenges um, that we encounter as we go through life, like miscarriage, abortion, abusive uh, relationships, suicide, rape, relationships with the pets, which is very important also for me. I am immensely grateful, Robert, for your time today. I'm so grateful to be able to see you like this, to connect with you and to share you and your, your God-given gift, literally, with those who are watching right now. So thank you so much for being with me. I'm really, really grateful. Would you like to say something in the beginning? Because I have lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to talk with you. And also thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. I, I think what you're doing is very important and will bring a lot of light and love into people's lives. So thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I would like to start very briefly because I can imagine for you the repetition of the same. It's not exciting as much anymore. <laughs> and we have to follow the breeze, right? So um, you used to work in the corporate America. And there was a moment when, was it the moment, Robert, when you were like, I have enough. You just reached this level of like, you have enough and you were looking for like an outlet or something that has more meaning. When was the shift that you decided to go to the psychic and have the reading done and then your life changed? 
Well, uh, let me start by telling your audience, uh, my website is YourSoulsPlan.com uh, and you can read large portions of Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift for free on the website. Uh, what happened with me uh, is basically what you just said. I was in the corporate world for a number of years. I have an MBA. Uh, I was self-employed as a marketing and communications consultant, basically doing different kinds of corporate writing. And I found this work to be very, very unfulfilling. Uh, you know, I used to tell people at the time that I had the feeling if I fell off the face of the earth, my clients would hardly even notice that I was gone. They just plug somebody else into that role and carry right along. But at the same time, I had this very distinct sense that there, there was some purpose to my life here, something I was supposed to be doing that I wasn't doing. And I wasn't sure how to figure out what it was. So. I tried various conventional routes. I went for career counseling. I took that Myers-Briggs inventory. It was interesting, but it didn't really tell me what to do with my life. I talked to all my friends and family and asked them, what do you think I should do with my life? Which by the way, is not a good question to ever ask somebody else because they have no way of knowing. Uh, and they just shrugged their shoulders and said, I have no idea. And so this idea came to me, go see a psychic medium. Knowing what I know now, I have to think that this idea was whispered in my ear by one of my spirit guides. But at that time in my life, uh, this is back in 2003, I didn't even know what a spirit guide was. I'd never even heard that term before. But this idea came to me, go to a psychic medium. So I did a little research. I chose somebody and had my first session ever with the medium on May 7 of 2003. And the reason I remember that date is that this was the day on which my life changed. Yeah. She started the session by saying, your spirit guides are here. And I said, uh, what's a spirit guide? And she said, well, a spirit guide is a highly evolved non-physical being with whom we plan our lives before we're born and who guide us through our lives after we come into body. And then she said, your guides would like to talk to you. And she started to channel them. And the first thing they said was, you planned your life, including your biggest challenges before you were born. And I just shook my head and I said, well, why in the world would I have done that? And they said, you did this for purposes of spiritual growth. Now, I come from a conventional background and probably would have dismissed all of this as some kind of delusion on my part, except that the guides then launched into this detailed explanation of why I had planned all my challenges. And the, the compelling part of it was that they knew what all of my challenges had been without me telling them anything about myself. Mm -hmm. Nor had I told the medium anything about myself before the session. Mm -hmm. So these beings clearly knew literally everything about me and they were able to provide quite detailed cogent explanations for why I had wanted to experience my biggest challenges. Well, I came out of that session with my mind just blown yeah. wide open and I thought about this perspective and thought about it and thought about it. And the effect that it had on me was that it created quite a deep healing because it allowed me to see for the first time mm -hmm. deeper meaning and purpose to challenges that previously had seemed like meaningless suffering. And then when I saw the kind of healing it could create for me, I thought, well, if this kind of perspective can create this sort of healing for me, then surely it can do the same for others. And it was at that point that I first started to think about writing a book on the subject. And then from that point on, all sorts of things just, you know, Synchronistic, synchronistically fell into place. And three years later, there was your soul's plan. I want to ask you, Robert, when you were writing that book, the first one, did you feel as if it was them writing that through you? You know, I, I myself am not a medium or a channel. I'm not clairvoyant or clairaudient. So I, I except for one or two moments when something clearly came through, I didn't have, I wasn't hearing words or seeing guides mm -hmm. next to me, but even so I had the sense the whole time I wrote the first book and also the second book that I just happened to be one member of a pretty large team. Uh, and I'm the okay. one who's in a body with his fingers going over a keyboard but I had the distinct sense that I was getting help from a number of uh, beings much wiser than myself. And I tell you why I think this from the reader standpoint, because when I read your book, I, I, I believe this deeply in my core that truth is simple. Truth is not complicated. 
and people complicate it or other agendas complicate the truth but truth is simple and the way how your book you read the book it's actually written in in a very simple way but it's very profound information and i think that's the most powerful way actually to touch the reader to connect with the reader but i would like to ask you i have so many questions it's because i was like so excited to talk to you robert okay the first question i actually have is about the guides so I have a very strong sense myself, I am an old soul and I see, I have, I have clairvoyant visions, not all the time, but I do. So I will ask some questions that actually I might have the answers to in a way myself, but I know my audience might not. But I would love to know if you can explain or describe when we are talking, when you're saying about the guides, are those guides the same in each lifetime we choose to be born? Is it the same group of guides? Do they change? And also, is there a number of them? Like, is the same number? And are they angels, archangels? Because the soul group is the group of people, let's say, what we call people. It's a group of souls who enter the human body um, in a form of agreement to help us to go through certain tasks that we choose. So guides, I would say, from my understanding, are on a different level, different dimension of influence. So how how would you how would you describe those uh, those group of the guides and then the the soul groups, because they are very different, Robert, right? So my understanding of a soul group is that it's a collection of souls who are at more or less the same evolutionary stage, which is another way of saying more or less the same vibration. So you and the other members of your soul group, you take turns playing every conceivable role for each other in your various incarnations on Earth. You and the other members of your soul group will be husband and wife, mother and daughter, father and son, best of friends, teacher and student, employer and employee, and even things like murderer and the one who is murdered. And at the soul level, there's no judgment of any of these roles. They're seen as roles on a stage. We're like actors on the stage playing out these roles. And every role is viewed as valuable as a, a growth and learning and healing opportunity. Now the guides, uh, sometimes people are guided by loved ones who have crossed over, okay. but many of the guides are further along uh, in the evolutionary path. They're at a higher vibration. They may well be beyond needing to incarnate on earth. Sometimes angels, as I understand it, serve as guides to people once they get into body. Uh, May, well, I ask you, may I ask you, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt you, no. like the ascendant masters, right? The, people have different religions, but let's say someone who believes in Yeshua and Jesus, can you also say that he is one of the guides? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, I was having a personal channeling session once when uh, Quan Yin, the ascended master, came through, and she said to me, I have adopted you. And that, moment, that was when I realized that she is one of my guides. Uh, but the ascended oh. masters, the ascended masters, as I understand it, are at a higher vibration than the average guide. The average guide is at a higher vibration than the beings they're guiding, but they're not yet ascended masters usually. Uh, what I've seen in my work as a hypnotist uh, is that people do have the same guide or guides across many different lifetimes. But then new guides will come in regularly depending upon what they plan for an upcoming lifetime. Okay. And then also depending upon the free will decisions they make once they're in body. So for example, let's say that you uh, make a free will decision that you are going to study medicine and become a doctor. And maybe that was not discussed in your pre-birth planning session. Well, that free will decision could very well and probably would attract to you a guide who was a medical doctor in a, an incarnation in the past. 
So depending upon what you decide, you'll call to you the expertise that you need. You know, it's amazing because you literally answer a question that I had as a last question. And you know what it was? Because I feel like in my life, I want to use myself as an example because it's my life, so I know my life the best. <laughs> Robert, I feel like I had many lifetimes within this life. Like so many, like I'm sometimes confused. I had so many personalities. If people say bipolar, I was like 55, seven type polar, whatever. So many different experiences, like not, I read in my book too, but it's the point that I had so different stages of my life that I don't know what I was planning <laughs> before I came, but it had to be something very um, intrigued in this whole map of planning. But when I decided or I felt that I had to write the book, and actually I have to thank you because that's another subject about the title of my book. Your book is connected with that. I felt a spirit to the very end of Ernest Hemingway. Like all of a sudden, Ernest Hemingway was helping me to write. And I was never like, you know, crazy about his writing, but I started to feel his energy literally um, like he was like very straightforward, like very bold and straight to the point. And I'm like, what's going on here? But I just took that and then I went with it. So I guess that was for me, like someone just show up along the way from my guides. <laughs> but that's amazing. It's just, um, it's, it's like they are always there, you know? Yeah, they're, they're always there. And again, you call to you whoever it is that you most need, depending upon the decisions you've made in the lifetime. Now, do we have to, do we have to come back if we don't make peace with certain people? My understanding is that nobody is forced to come back but you choose to come back, which I know many people find hard to believe, but your perspective when you're home in the non-physical is very different from your perspective when you're here in body. Uh, one of the main differences is that from the non-physical vantage point, you're acutely aware of the fact that an incarnation on earth is very brief. Now, you might or might not know that when you're here in body, but you do know that from the other side. Uh, also, from the other side, you know that nobody is permanently harmed by anything that happens here. Again, you might or might not know that when you're in body, but you do know that on the other side. And the third key difference in perspective is that from the other side, you are absolutely certain uh, and very much aware of the fact that the wisdom that comes out of an incarnation becomes part of you literally for all eternity. Again, you might or might not know that in body. So from that perspective, that life is actually very brief no one is permanently harmed by anything that happens here. And yet the wisdom becomes part of you for all eternity. From that perspective, it actually does make sense that you would choose to come back and also plan in some cases to have very difficult challenges. You know, when you're saying this, Robert, I have two thoughts. First is I, for many, many years, I used to be very avid um, listener, student of Abraham Hicks, Esther and Jerry Hicks. And I followed them for, for some time. I was in the hot seat. And they always say this, Abraham says, you never get it done <laughs> and you never get it wrong. And they, the, the, the essence of their teaching of the infinite intelligence really is like what you're saying, that there is um, like, there is always love you return to and there is always light you return to. And that's who you are, is the pure essence of who you are. And uh, it really is all about raising your frequency, which in simple words mean to feel good and look for the occupations or things or places or people, I think, as I understand that, that feel good, as simple as it sounds. What I found um, challenging for me for some time, now it's a little more, 
I found a new passion with this YouTube channel and connecting like this with people. And I think finally coming to the point when I can express what I have been experiencing on my spiritual journey for all those years. I found it quite, especially lately with this whole lockdown situation, confusing where I really belong as far as ge like geography wise. Because <laughs> they're, they're, the places that used to excite me, they, I'm not sure, or I just don't know exactly where, where, where is a good place, you know, like, how, how would you say now, as far as following the bliss and being, being in the flow when you really lose the sense of time, I think really suffering extends the time, being in the bliss shrinks the time, I, that's how I see it. You don't think about time because it doesn't exist. How would you advise those who are watching us right now in this very current reality, which I think is a gift. It's not easy, but it's a gift for us to really unite, to rise to higher frequency, to stand for the truth, to see what really is important in life, to have compassion. Not everyone will wake up, but to, to raise higher as a, as a soul. This is such an opportunity for so many souls at the same time. That's how I see it. But how would you advise people now to find that bliss, Robert, or that place within that they can feel better? Well, I always tell people uh, meditation and prayer will take you about 80% of wherever you want to go. And the other 20% is going to be something that's unique to you that you will have to figure out on your own. But I, I would encourage everybody to have a regular prayer and meditation practice daily, if at all possible. Uh, and it's even better to meditate more than once a day. And it doesn't have to be for long periods of time. Even just a few seconds is better than nothing. Uh, also, you know, when you talk about raising your vibration, people always say, okay, how do I do that? Uh, really, it's pretty simple. Just make the most loving decisions you can make. Mm -hmm. You know, what I found in my research for Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift is that there are many, many different kinds of lessons that we choose to learn on the earth plane, but they all have a common denominator. If you distill all the lessons down, the common denominator is that we're learning how to give and receive love. Yeah. So ask yourself, what can I do to better give love? What can I do to better receive love? And by the way, those two things are equally important. A lot of people get lost in focusing on giving love. Yep. And when others want to give to them, they're not willing to receive. If you're not willing to receive love from others, you're blocking the flow of love in the world just as effectively as if you never give love to other people. Uh, and the other thing I would say is, and this is not new, but it, it's quite important, Follow your excitement and follow your joy. Excitement and joy are communications from your soul saying, yes, this is the way for you. So anything that excites you or brings you joy, there's something there that's part of your pre-birth plan. So thank you for this, Robert. I want to ask you also the communication we have with guides. Um, is it by thought form? feeling what what would you say the the way how they communicate from your experience the guides with us and the is it, is it different depending on the person or there are certain uh ways that it's always by this like it's a sense it's the gut feeling is the thought form it's maybe like a person we meet who kind of directs us to something what would you say is that communication well, when in my hypnosis practice, I tell all of my clients before the session, uh, there are four primary modes of receiving information or communication from spirit in a hypnosis session. And those are visual, so you might see the guides or see the council of elders, uh, auditory, so maybe you hear the guides or the council talking to you, even though you don't actually see them. Feelings or emotions. So you ask a question about your life, a feeling washes over you, and the feeling itself is a communication from spirit that is intended to answer your question. 
And then a fourth mode is uh, sun immediate and full downloads of information, knowings without knowing how you know. You ask a question, you just immediately and fully know the answer. You don't see or hear anything. You don't even know how you know the answer, but you know the answer. Or it can be any combination of those four things. That's amazing. Thank you so much. And some of those actually experience what you said. It's, it's very powerful. Robert, I want to ask you this. Do you think, is there something like a curse that can be put on someone's life? And do you think that so, there are some entities that can actually affect someone's um, life's plan that was, you know, planned before life. Do you think it's possible? Are you talking about negative entities? Yeah. So in terms of curses, um, my understanding is that a curse can only work if the person who is being cursed believes that they are cursed. If you don't believe that someone has put a curse on you, then it doesn't matter what they did or said, it's not going to have any effect on you. Remember, you are the creator, you are an aspect of God. Therefore, your beliefs are going to manifest in front of you. If you choose to believe that someone has cursed you, that's going to show up in your experience. So just don't make that choice. In terms of negative entities, uh, there is such a phenomenon. Uh, negative entities, uh, sometimes are people who have, they were incarnate, they died, and they have not gone on into the light for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and they often latch on to the subtle energetic body, the etheric body around the physical body. A lot of times this happens in situations of alcoholism or drug addiction. Mm -hmm. So the incarnate person has a drug addiction or is experiencing alcoholism that causes what you could call a hole or a weakness mm -hmm. in the subtle etheric bodies around the physical body. And then a so-called negative entity who has not moved into the light and who perhaps had alcoholism or a drug addiction while in body will then latch on to that opening, that area of weakness, uh, almost in a parasitic sort of way. They're feeding off the incarnate beings, alcoholism or drug addiction. Um, this is not my area of expertise, but there are many people who do have expertise in this area. And if you feel that that's something that's happening in your life, you can find people who can help you on the internet. Now, when, oh, let me, because I could, I will just go on the flow with the questions, but I, I written those and they're actually quite important. Now, would you say, Robert, the more challenging the relationship is, the bigger the gift in this relationship for us all? Potentially. It, it depends on, on what is planned though. Uh, some relationships are planned to be very difficult. Some are planned to be much easier. And then you have the planning interacting and intersecting with the free will decisions of all the personalities who are involved. Um, with a difficult relationship, you, you might ask yourself the question, uh, if I planned these difficulties in this relationship before I was born, why might I have done that? And when you phrase the question that way, number one, it doesn't actually require you to believe in pre-birth planning, but number two, it takes you immediately to the deeper meaning of those difficulties. And once you know what the deeper meaning is, then you can learn the lessons in a much more conscious, less arduous, and less painful manner. So if I, for example, see a certain cycles in my life, like repetition of certain, let, let's use me as an example completely, like this is very vulnerable right now. If I see, and it wasn't really in the early years of my life, but lately in, in quite some time, loneliness to the point that I'm really literally by myself completely, um, and it's like, almost like, it seems like I, I see my life like in the future, like in a way, Robert, I communicate with my future self and, and I have done this before. Like I was receiving from my, from my future and now I'm like kind of giving back to old me, like guiding, uh, that me with decisions. 
but I feel like I cannot kind of come out of this loneliness. That's one thing. Another is, for example, money situation, like creating and then literally like not having anything. And then again, it's, it's like um, very, very um, exhausting sometimes. And another thing is because I've realized that in a way I am grateful for the solitude because during the solitude I'm able to go really deep and I am, I'm like really discovering so much. So it's almost like hard for me to, to believe that there is someone who is matching that, but then I can talk like this to people like yourself. So I'm like, there are people like me so how is this, this as far as going through life and like I have awareness of this and now, now is it another courageous decision that I have to make and I will mention later what, what crazy decisions I made that completely changed my life because of those decisions. So do we have to, what, what we can do if we are in the situations like this? Well, your, your question reminds me of an exercise that we do in my uh, workshop. Uh, I have a workshop based upon my, my books, uh, and we do it online and in person. And one of the exercises is called the Divine Virtues. Uh, it gives you insight into the qualities you planned before you were born to cultivate and express in this lifetime. And it's one of the main reasons you planned your biggest challenges, because from a pre-birth planning perspective, your biggest challenges are seen as providing both the opportunity and the motivation to cultivate and express the virtues. And the virtues are things like unconditional love, patience, empathy, compassion, faith, trust, and so on. Uh, we work with a list of 30 of them in the Divine Virtues exercise. So the reason I mention this is that part of the exercise consists of creating a timeline of challenges. And as people review the, the timeline that they've created, a lot of times a pattern emerges in which the same kind of challenge keeps coming back around. And not only does it keep coming back around, but each time it comes back, it comes back in more intense form. And what I've seen in my work is that if you have that kind of pattern in your life, that is your soul really trying hard to get your attention about something. It means that you missed the lesson the first time, Maybe you missed it the second and third time, and it's gonna keep coming back around in an increasingly intense form until you get the lesson. Now, don't go into fear about that. I don't want anybody to go into fear about it. That's actually the opposite of what I want. But just be aware that this does happen. And if you see that kind of pattern in your life, it's worth really thinking about what the underlying lesson is. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, I, I really, appreciate what you just said because it's really spoken to my heart right now. I would like to ask you um, from the soul standpoint, is it we have the plan before we are born and what if we try to complete certain um, like work with certain virtues, like we would like to become, let's say more compassionate or more whatever, courageous, whatever it is. And let's say we, we don't quite complete that task, but we are trying. Is it enough for the soul just to try, like attempt to do it, not quite become that virtue, but attempt, do whatever you can possibly to do that but not become it, is it enough to move to another one? Or we have to kind of come back and repeat this to the point when we literally become that virtue? So that, as I understand it, is an individual decision. Uh, each virtue has many, many layers, and you can keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into the same virtues over the course of many, many lifetimes but you don't have to. You're the one who decides you want to go deeper or you're complete with certain virtues and you'd like to go on and work on others. And this comes up in the life review. At the end of every incarnation, each one of us has the life review and you'll be shown the scenes of, for example, where you were compassionate and where you were not compassionate. And when the life review is over, 
you'll talk with your guides and your higher self and uh, ascended masters and so on mm -hmm. about whether you would like to go deeper into compassion or what other vir virtues you were working on, or would you like to go on to something else? Um, what I have seen in my work is that if you feel incomplete with your experience with certain virtues, the feeling of incompletion is the karma. And so if you have that feeling of incompletion, you will most likely plan to work on the same virtues in the next lifetime. On the other hand, if you feel complete with those, then there is no karma and you would go on to do something else. So in this point, when we are um, merging back to non-physical, like Abraham says, <laughs> and we are in this, let's say, healing waiting room, I will call it, the space. Now, that is a place that we are in between lives and we are there. How long are we there? Are we there as long as we make peace with the life we just completed? So and the, the Bardo state, which is the term that is sometimes used to, to describe the in-between incarnations place, um, is a very individualized experience. And it, it sounded like you just alluded to the fact that uh, some people go to places of healing when they cross over. That's true. That's my understanding as well. There are, for lack of a better term, hospitals on the other side, where if you've had a, a very traumatic life, you go to one of these centers of healing and spend whatever time you need to there in order to heal from the incarnation. But many people have no need of that. Uh, so they can go more quickly into a new lifetime if that's what they choose to do. Uh, you know, the universe is infinite in nature. Everything you can think of exists, and there are many things that you can't think of exist. Mm -hmm. And so it's entirely up to you what you're going to go on to do next. Nobody is forcing anybody to do anything. And do you think, Robert, that the soul of the dog always comes back into another dog? You know, there, there's a chapter in my second book, Your Soul's Gift, about the pre-birth planning that we do with pets. And my, my knowledge of this is limited to the story in that chapter. Uh, so I don't know the answer to the question that you just asked, but I do know from having researched that chapter that pets are part of our pre-birth planning. Um, the woman who is the subject of that chapter she decides for reasons of her own that she's going to be a dwarf in this lifetime. She's four feet, eight inches tall. And after making that decision, her guides say to her in the pre-birth planning session, you know, this is going to be very difficult, especially when you're a child. The other kids are going to ostracize you and tease you because you're so short. What kind of supports do we need to put in place so that you can get through this experience and learn from it? And the plan they come up with is that she will be surrounded by all sorts of unconditionally loving pets. And then they come into her pre-birth planning session. There are future cats, her future dogs, her future horses. Uh, there's even a, a rooster named Crooked Beak. And they all come into her planning session and speak in extremely intelligent terms about how they are going to give her the unconditional love she needs to get through the experience of being a dwarf. You know, Robert, I could cry now because I actually had to give my dog away. When I, I make a decision, um, I left United States, I went back to Poland with my dog. And then I decided because my guides, literally my guides, my higher self was telling me to return to United States and rebuild my life again. I had nervous breakdown and I had to find a new home for my dog. When I was reading this chapter in your book, it was really, um, it was difficult for me, you know. I felt like someone pulled my heart out of my chest. He's very happy now, but still, you know, there is this, um, this place that I still need some love there. But I would like to ask you this, and this is actually very important because I read in, in your book that too, and I was so struck by that. When I make this decision, I came back to US and I completely broke relationship with my parents. It was just very recently. I didn't talk to them for a year. And my mother passed away when I was back in States and they were there. And I decided later to go and to help my father 
which he got depressed, but we were on a very bad terms, very bad terms. And I was reading your book when this was happening, when I made this decision to go back there, it was very difficult for me. I didn't want to return there. And my soul was telling me, you have to go, you have to go, no matter how hard you have to go. So I went there, not to move there, but just to help him and to literally bring him back to life, to put him together, you know? And I felt that was like one of the plans of my soul, at least the one I can recall at this point. But then I had your book, literally, I had it on, on Kindle. And I would like you to show maybe if you have, if you don't, I will attach anyway. But I remember I was reading in your book and I was already back in US, rebuilding myself, just helping my father in Poland, right? And reading your book and then it says, the story, I forgot who it was. Those people were incredible in your book, those real stories something about United States, that United States is a very important country in the spiritual evolution of this planet. And it was just coming to me. I'm like, no wonder I, I moved to US twice, like literally twice. <laughs> and I'm reading this and I said, that's why I went back there because there is, um, there is, a, there is an energy and there is like, a, like a, almost, if I can say this, a sole purpose for United States, if I can say it like that. So I would like to hear from you, Robert, how you see US as you're an American. I mean, we are not really nationalities, I know, but let's say in this lifetime, um, how you see United States, the, the purpose of the soul of US? Well, I, my understanding is that the uh, founding fathers who created the constitution on which the, the US government is based uh, were incarnations, in many cases, of very highly evolved ascended masters. Wow. So they were bringing through uh, very high vibrational ideals about liberty and freedom and justice yes. and integrity and so forth. And so the ideals upon which the U.S. is based uh, were intended to be a model for the entire world. Now, I think we've strayed from that quite a bit. I think the current state of the United States is quite far removed from that original intention. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we can't get back there. The other thing I would say about the US, uh, there's a body of channel literature called the Michael system that talks in part about soul plan relative to soul age, uh, including where you choose to incarnate. And according to the Michael system, the US is made up primarily of young souls and young souls, according to Michael, are interested in exploring power. So they tend to come to a place like the United States, which lends itself to an exploration of power. Uh, whenever you feel complete with that experience and you're a middle-aged soul or a mature or old soul, so to speak, then you would be more likely to incarnate somewhere else. And then the lessons change. You become more interested in relationships, psychology, spiritual topics, uh, and power is no longer so important anymore. But do you do you mean by that as a place of birth or how is it with like immigrants like me? I was born in Poland, but my, I'm immigrated to US. So is this different? It, it might or might not be different. I, it's hard to say because I don't know what your pre-birth intentions were. I'd have to know a lot more about your particular plan. Uh, it could be, for example, that you chose to be born where you were born because you simply wanted to be the child of certain parents. Okay. But then the life plan called for you to come to the US because perhaps you wanted to explore issues of power or something else that the US is particularly uh, able to offer you. Okay. And do you think, Robert, that we are in a spiritual war right now? I, I would not want to use the word war. Um, I think that there... Shift. Shift is a better word. Uh, I think we're in the middle of a major shift. My understanding of the shift is that the earth and all the people on the earth have moved already from the third dimension into the fourth. And that's at a much higher vibration. There's a lot of light coming onto the planet. And the effect that the light has is that it brings up everything that's dark for the purpose of healing it and releasing yes. it. So you see this turbulence in governments all over the world. Yep. Um, there's been a shift in many countries to the far right yep. and the liberties are being infringed upon. 
this is because the light is bringing up all the darkness so that we can clear it and release it. And then the earth will move into the fifth dimension, which as I understand it is a dimension of unity consciousness. Uh, and at that point, things should be quite a bit better. So this is, I'm trying to pronounce this word. I always have challenge with this word, inevitable, right? How you say, like you cannot stop that. It's gonna happen. You mean inevitable? That's right. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. Robert, I am so thankful for your time today. Um, I'm beyond grateful. I would like you to mention, people can find you or your soul's purpose, um, yoursourceplan.com. Um, you also, do you still do those sessions? What was the name of this session? Uh, it's, called, it's called a between life soul regression. It's a form of hypnosis, usually takes between two and three hours. Uh, in which you talk to a group of beings known as the Council of Elders. The Council consists of the very wise, loving, and highly evolved beings who oversee reincarnation on Earth. And they know everything about you, every past life you've had, and everything about your plan for your current lifetime. So when people get to the Council of Elders, you can ask literally any question about your life. And if it's for your highest good to know the answer, the Council will answer your questions. People come out of a between life soul regression and they say things like, I have no more questions about my life. They answered every single one I had. Wow. And it's potentially a life changing experience. Wow. So are you, are you still doing this or are you like fully booked? People can book uh, with you? The next openings are in August of next year, but we do a group of between lives regression as part of the online and in person workshop. Uh, and the group regression is just as powerful as the private session. So if people don't want to wait for a private session, uh, the workshop is the way to go. And that schedule is on the events page at yoursoulsplan.com. How your events you see are going to unfold? Do you see them in person or how you feel with all those um, current events right now? Because I, I actually saw you went to Poland. You've been to Poland before too, right? I've seen it. Twice, yeah. Uh, and I was supposed to go back again this year, but because of COVID, it ended up being canceled. Hopefully, I'll get back there next fall. Um, I think it all depends on what happens with the vaccine. That could potentially turn things around. And then all the in-person workshops I have scheduled for 2021 will happen. If the vaccine doesn't turn things around, then I think it's just going to be online workshops for probably the whole year. May I ask you this question? I know it's quite controversial for many people, but this is the soul conversation. So how, how you see this as far as, I am not for it personally, I don't think it's necessary, but do you think people will have to take it in order to travel or you think we can avoid it as a human race? We don't need that. I think the most likely scenario is that most governments of the world will require that you have the vac vaccine in order to travel, in order to board a plane and go through customs. Uh, and then a lot of people are going to have a tough decision to make, including me, uh, because I, I would not want to take it, at least for a while, until we get more data about it. That's how I feel myself, yeah, yeah. It'll be a difficult decision. Yeah. Robert, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your work. And do you think you will be writing more books? Actually, the next book should come out in a few months. No way. Do you have a title? Your Soul's Love. It's about the pre-birth planning of certain aspects of romantic relationships. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. So I will stay you know, on the track with this and see how soon, because I will be one of the first who will be reading this book. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm going to attach all the links below for, for the viewers and very grateful for your work. Really, this book I will never forget to the rest of my life. Well, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much. You're welcome.